thank you very much for your kind invitation. This is my own function. Yeah. And uh, I'm really pleased to uh, speak to you, and particularly since the topic, uh, national question in Central Europe, is a topic which is extremely important, was extremely important, and I'm sure it will stay extremely important. So probably many of those uh, who are now listening here, and uh, including those, of course, who are giving the lecture, uh, will continue uh, to be uh, even obsessed with this question. Um, one of the, uh, the subtitle is democratic response to unresolved national and ethnic conflict. It's quite intriguing how is democracy coming into the picture. And it's not easy. It's not easy, first of all, to uh, have an understanding of what democracy is. Um, there is a rather famous saying of George Orwell. And George Orwell said that uh, democracy is a notion which everybody is very, very careful not to tie to any meaning. Because uh, we like to say that the good guys are the democracy. When um, Donald Rumsfeld, during the first Bush administration, was the liaison with the then friend and ally of um, the United States, Saddam Hussein, in the war of the United States against Iran, not the war, but in the uh, confrontation of the United States against Iran, then Saddam Hussein was uh, perceived as a uh, stable point of democracy in Iraq. Then later, when the same Donald Rumsfeld became uh, Minister of Defense and the main ally and the main enemy was Saddam Hussein, then again uh, there was nothing as anti-democratic as Saddam Hussein. And then the war on terror was also a war about democracy. And probably Saddam Hussein wasn't democratic at the time when he was a U.S. ally, and he wasn't democratic when he was a U.S. enemy. Uh, but the question is that the notion of democracy is sometimes just way too easily tied uh, to various settings. I remember a word of the late uh, Holbrook who was very active in finding a solution in the former Yugoslavia. And he said that the first democratic elections in Bosnia unfortunately did not yield a democratic result. And this was a very interesting saying and an interesting point of view of analysis. And particularly if one tried to see what is really the notion of democracy uh, behind this thing. I lived a very, very substantial chunk of my life in former uh, Yugoslavia. And all political analysts agreed that Tito would have won democratic elections. At the same time, Yugoslavia was a uh, communist one party dictatorship, and we did not have democratic elections. Uh, when there was the first multi party election, Milosevic won not exactly by fair means in 1990, but he probably would have won anyway. And he's the person who brought about a uh, true disaster. So the notion of democracy is, is not a simple one. And as Orwell said, it's really difficult to tie to any notion. Very often political players are saying those who are on our side are democracy, those who are on the opposite side are the opponents of democracy. And it still remains to be resolved and a lot of research is needed to find out what really democracy is and how should democracy be perceived and shaped. And this is a very, very difficult question. But let me now uh, make a step closer 
to uh, what is in the focus today. And this is democracy and the national question. And this is sometimes uh, an interesting synergy. Uh, sometimes it's very, very difficult to square uh, democracy and the national question. Uh, let me give you again a, an example from the former Yugoslavia, uh, which is and was and will remain a playing field of very interesting events regarding uh, national issues, given the uh, really extremely <coughs> diversified multi-ethnic structure. I remember that in Sarajevo, uh, there was a rule under the Tito regime that the dean of the law school should change every second year, and after a, a Serb would come a Muslim, now the term in Bosniak, and after Bosniak a Croat. And if you see, uh, um, go to the main room, of Sarajevo Law School, you see deans about in this order. And uh, this was not uh, that people, the members of the faculty who were actually at that time electing deans, it was not exactly that they wanted precisely to be so. It was a party line, it was a uh, political uh, issue, and it was the implementation of this political line by the basically the Communist Party at the uh, law school, and the same applied to the university. <clears throat> now, after the horror and uh, uh, of the war, after the ethnic conflict, uh, if you see the latest deans, they are all Muslim or all Muslim. And it's a damn difficult question to say what was better. Uh, probably uh, the fact that these are now all Bosniaks and all Muslims stems from the uh, will of the majority. And normally one would say that the will of the majority is democracy. And it's difficult to contest this. It's also true that this will is somewhat tainted by a quite strong undercurrent. Uh, the recent ethnic tensions, which probably are guiding many people to choose not always the one who is exactly the best, but the one who belongs to my ethnic group and not the ethnic group of the other. It's possible, of course, that all these Muslims who were elected after the war were actually really the best people. But it's somehow odd to see that this uh, uh, rhythm and sequence of ethnic changes was completely discontinued. And this is uh, really the core of the problem when we are dealing with democracy in a multinational and multi-ethnic sense. Uh, under communism, uh, in Yugoslavia, uh, we had a rule which was actually a rule prompted by the fact that Tito did not belong to the majority. Tito was a Croat, and that's why, unlike many other communist dictators, he wasn't relying on majority nationalism. The majority nationalism would not have bolstered Tito. He didn't belong to the majority. So that's why the Tito kind of communism was much more relying on balance uh, rather than on um, ethnic primacy or like in, in some other countries of Eastern Europe. Ceausescu, for example. Uh, and this led to uh, this principle of balance be which became a sometimes rather rigid party line. Then the question is whether this was good or bad. And it is not an easy question. Uh, and it is not only uh, an issue which is being solved by a matter of party line, party rule, and a heavy party hand. In Belgium, you also have rules about the number of Flemish and uh, uh, 
Wallon, French speakers, both in the Parliament and even in the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court you have a ratio. Uh, this time it's not a ratio set by the party, but a ratio set by law. So the big question is whether uh, in a situation where you have ethnic identities, where you have ethnic traditions, when you have ethnic tensions. Uh, whether a one-man, one-vote democracy would yield a solution, or whether you need a more complex structure, uh, which would be uh, not exactly the one-man, one-vote democracy. And this is the pattern not only in a communist Yugoslavia, but it's a pattern in uh, uh, Belgium and in a number of other countries, Canada. So this leads us to the very, very important threshold question. Um, one has to perceive democracy as a system in which everybody is equal and this one man, one law principle. And we have an ethnic reality in which these principles need some uh, adjustments. And which adjustments are actually in line with some democratic ideas and which are contrary to such uh, ideas, it's very difficult to perceive. Another uh, critically important issue is the issue which groups are those to which these adjustments may extend. In Switzerland, for example, um, the Swiss Supreme Court has extremely important and high quality decisions, and uh, I'm reading those decisions which are important in my uh, professional field. So I know that the Supreme Court is issuing decisions in French and German mostly, but also in Italian, and there have been a very few decisions in the Retro-Romano language. Retro-Romano language is one of the ancient languages in, in Switzerland, which has some standing, but it's a vanishing uh, language. Uh, French and German are certainly in the uh, mainstream position. Italian is also getting some recognition. Um, so these are the languages which have appeared as languages of the Supreme Court. And you could say that this is some maybe democratic gesture, and certainly gesture towards a multi-ethnic and multicultural approach. But actually in Switzerland there are probably much many more Albanians today than Retro and probably many former Yugoslavia people served and crowd and referred. Should the Supreme Court then be compelled in some cases to uh, yield and to formulate decisions in Retro Romano or not? Now this uh, brings some very, very uh, difficult and critical questions. Uh, whether the rights of certain groups, specific treatment, are rights of all individuals belonging to various groups. And whether there are some difference which should be made between uh, traditional um, residents of a certain area and newcomers, immigrants. This was a big issue in Slovenia when the question was of minority rights, and minority rights in Slovenia were granted to Italians and Hungarians who have lived there for centuries, but were not granted uh, to serve the Bosniaks who uh, emigrated to Slovenia during the last uh, decades and do not have such traditional and historical roots as the Italian minority or the Hungarian minority. So the question is whether uh, the Swiss approach is correct by 
allowing special linguistic treatment and rights uh, to those uh, language groups and national groups and ethnic groups who have lived in Switzerland for centuries, which are the um, French, the German, the Italian, and the Indirect Roman. Or better, rights should be granted to those who are getting numerous and uh, who are getting uh, to an important level. And the same issue is arising regarding Turks, particularly in Germany. Uh, in Germany, you have much broader minority rights uh, which are granted to Danish, who have been living in Germany again for centuries and who have some traditional established rights. Uh, then to Turks, and you have millions of Turks in, in Germany, unlike Danes. So the question is here, if we uh, consider some groups and group rights, then um, which are the relevant groups? And I do not have a perfect answer. But I can tell you that at this moment, uh, the relevant groups, the minority groups, are those groups which are recognized by law in a given country, and many countries are giving a list of the relevant groups. This is also the case in Hungary, which is giving a list of, I don't know, 30 minorities, maybe somebody knows this better than me, about 13 or exactly 13 minorities, which doesn't mean that they are this is all because there are some uh, people who have become Hungarian citizens and who do not belong to these groups. Uh, I know somebody from Cameroon who became a Hungarian citizen, but his language is not a recognized minority language. So one thing is to set it by law or, or somehow to set it by certain practice, but uh, it has become clear that uh, these rights, uh, which minority groups have, um, cannot extend to each and every citizen. So there is a uh, dividing line between group rights and individual rights. And uh, there are people who are actually denying group rights and this is a big issue, a big debate, uh, I do not think that it is possible uh, to have um, a democratic life and a normal life in many countries without recognizing some group rights. It's another question is which groups are the relevant groups and that's a very, very difficult question. <laughs> I don't think Spain could exist without recognizing some identity of the Basque or the Catalan or of others. I don't think, uh, I've mentioned Belgium could exist. I don't think Switzerland could exist. Many other countries could simply not exist as a country without recognizing some uh, group. Now the question is, uh, uh, what are these uh, uh, rights. And what <coughs> kind of democracy is uh, group sensitive uh, democracy? <coughs> what is rather obvious is the right pertaining to language and culture. Because if we are coming to language and culture, then it looks maybe odd, but only at first sight, in these areas, the basic human right to be equal is actually a right to be different. Uh, you are not equal without the right to be different. If you have, there is now, let me go again, again back to the former Yugoslavia, there is a big debate about Cyrillic script in Yugoslavia. Bukovar was one of the places in which the Croatian sufferings were particularly uh, dramatic. 
Kukuar is also a place which has a sizable Serbian minority. <laughs> and after long hesitation, the new uh, Croatian government decided that there should be scripts in both Latin and Syriac language. Uh, here, the right of uh, the Serbian minority is a right to be different not to be equal with the uh, majority. The right of the Hungarian minority in Vojvodina is not to be equal and to have only Subotica, uh, but to be equal and have also the Hungarian name, which is Sabah. Uh, the right to be equal in Switzerland is not for Germans to learn French or French to learn German. Actually, they all speak both French and German, but to have uh, public inscriptions, to have schools in more than one language. So if we are talking about uh, equality, equality in a multi-ethnic setting, equality means difference. There's no other way, there's no other road towards equality, but equality by a difference. Uh, equality in Serbia doesn't mean that everybody and everything has to be in Serbia. Equality in Hungary doesn't mean that all schools have to be in Hungarian or Equality in Hungary means, of course, you have Hungarian schools, but there should be a, a Serbian school as well, and there's a Croatian school as well, and there are other schools as well. That is equality. Equality in the Vojvodina doesn't mean that everybody speaks the majority language, which is Serbian, but it means that Hungarians should have a right to have their schools, to have their theaters, to have their culture in Hungarian, and the uh, Slovaks or the Romanians in Vojvodina should also have a right to maintain their culture. So uh, this is a point where it's very obvious that equality is a somewhat more uh, delicate and uh, more complex problem. Uh, the International Court of Justice, in an African-related case, said that equality for equals means equality. Equality for those who are different means different, different treatment. And that's very simply true. Those who are equal linguistically, culturally, should be treated equally. Those who are different can only be equal if they also have a right to assert their culture and not only the culture of the majority. Uh, probably the only way uh, to allow this within the democratic setting is some vehicle of cultural autonomy. It is very difficult to perceive and very difficult to have any uh, other way of expressing equality, which is the basic principle of democracy and, and human uh, level and human standards, is to allow uh, equality via uh, difference. Now, let me here mention one more point which is sometimes used and understood and sometimes misunderstood. And this is the uh, issue of positive discrimination. Uh, positive discrimination is actually a notion which uh, gained, it didn't really arise first in the United States, but it became somehow well known and important to US practice. But it was uh, stated uh, in the case and in some other cases that uh, it is possible for someone, uh, for example, admission to a school, uh, to give a positive discrimination, to give uh, easier standards to those who belong to a minority. And here is essentially the uh, issue of the blacks. And here the logic was the following. Since blacks were suppressed, 
since they were in slavery. And actually the suppression of blacks uh, lasted longer than one thinks. Uh, I was stunned when I read that in 1936 there was the Olympics in Berlin and one of the most um, significant and um, really fantastic denial of Hitler's uh, uh, theory was that Jesse Owens, a black man, won four medals. So the theory that uh, all these are lower races, that they are high races and lower races, was absolutely denied by Jesse Owens. And uh, Jesse Owens was a hero, not only because he was the best runner in the world, but he was also a hero in defying Hitler and defying fascism. And he was celebrated. But when he returned to the US and went to college, he was not allowed to be in the same dormitory that he was allowed for whites. And when he went to a hotel, uh, he was not allowed to be in that hotel because it was a hotel for whites. So even uh, when we have this, uh, when we had this extremely, he was the hero. He was the hero of the United States, of course, and rightly so. Yet, uh, discrimination still lasts. Uh, so it was um, the discrimination of blacks, when I was studying in the U.S. in the uh, 60s, late 60s, then in some U.S. Uh, states, not in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I was studying, but in Georgia, for example, uh, in buses it was still disallowed for blacks to sit in front rows. And school buses were segregated school buses. So this is why an American decision saying that positive discrimination is needed uh, was extremely important in a historic context. But there was an interesting uh, added line of thinking. And that added line was that this is something temporary. Uh, this is not forever. Uh, black kids will not have a right to a positive discrimination forever. They will have this right until uh, the blacks become socially, economically equal. And then there would be no reason anymore to say that somebody, although has a somewhat lower record, will nevertheless be accepted as a black. And I think this is about right. When it's damn difficult to say when will this moment come when uh, blacks will be really de facto equal with whites. But it's true that if you are discriminating, uh, if some group was discriminated historically, if and when this group is regaining full equality, and of course with the election of Obama, uh, it's in the right way that this may be something temporary. The problem is when uh, this uh, concept, temporariness of positive discrimination, is transplanted or when it's, one is trying to transplant it to an area where we are talking about ethnic because the right of the Flemish uh, to their Flemish culture in Belgium is not temporary until they all become French. And the right of the Ballon is not temporary until they all become uh, Flemish. And the right of the Hungarians in Vojvodina to have Hungarian schools should not be temporary. Uh, they should have Hungarian schools. And the right of Croats to have Croat schools, uh, Croatian schools in the way of the should also be uh, permanent. And the right of the Serbs to have Serbian schools in Croatia should also be permanent. So it is misleading, <coughs> uh, dangerous, and simply wrong to try to translate to the, the, the concept of temporariness of positive discrimination to the area we are really talking about um, ethnic groups. 
the blacks have been economically and socially discriminated, and once they raise to a level, then the logic of the Supreme Court of the United States really makes sense that this is a positive discrimination which may end at some point, and should end at some point. However, the rights of ethnic groups to maintain their culture should not be uh, of a temporary nature. And we are closing, we are getting close to uh, the time limit of my lecture. Let me end one line at the end. And this is this dividing line between temporariness and permanence. I think that uh, both those majority members who are against a multicultural situation and would like just everybody to belong to the majority, and also those uh, minority members who are on the radical side are somehow on the side of temporariness. Um, many people in, I don't know how many, but there are quite a few uh, people in Serbia who believe that the fact that in the Vojvodina there are several languages, Hungarian, Slovak, Romanian, Croatian, now Montenegrin has also appeared, can be tolerated, but it's only temporary until everybody is accepting Serbian as the only language. Uh, so this is the majority uh, perception, I think, unhealthy perception of term of temporariness. The minority perception of temporariness, yes, 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 we have now this situation of minority rights, but it is only until we have a change of border and then everything will get back and everything. So I think the, uh, particularly within the European Union and within this situation, I think one should accept multiculturalism and uh, coexistence and cohabitation of culture and languages, not as something temporary, but as something permanent. The fact that there are Hungarian schools in Sabatka but it's, uh, is uh, justified, it's right, it's fair, it's according to international principle, and it should keep being there. It should be, Serbia should remain a multicultural state. And uh, I also wish a Serbian uh, school, which exists in Budapest, to keep existing. It adds to the uh, diversity of this country, it's add to the cultural landscape of Hungary. So I think uh, we have to discard the issue, the approach of temporariness, and we have to accept a multi-ethnic and multicultural setting as something permanent in the And thank you very much. This is what I want to share.